Psalm 51. Psalm 51. A messenger came to the king one day, and he told the king that there were two men living in a city, and one man was extremely wealthy and had many, many flocks of sheep. And there was another man who only had one little ewe to call his own. The man with many sheep cared for his sheep as a normal person would, but the one who had one cared for his very, very intently. He fed it from his table. He let it sleep in the home. He took care of it like it was actually one of his own children. And one day, a person was traveling to the city that the rich man was going to welcome in, and the rich man needed to help feed and care for this new guest that was coming through the town. And he took, instead of taking one of the sheep from his own flock, he instead took a sheep from the one person, the one, that, the, the one sheep that the one man had. When the king heard about this, he was angry, of course, and demanded that the man who took the one sheep repay back the person that had the, or the man that took the sheep from the one man repay back to him fourfold, and that there should be something done to the man for his sin. And the messenger told him, you are the man. This is a story from 2 Samuel 12, when Nathan comes to David after David had sinned with Bathsheba, and all the story that will go there, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, and the Lord sent Nathan to David to tell him and to call him out for his sin. So as he was telling him the story, David's anger rages against this man who would do such a horrible thing. And then Nathan tells him, you are that man, and the Lord has sent me to tell you to repent. That's why we at the top of your passage, if you have in your Bible, it might say to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him. So as we get into the chapter, it's important that we get the background of what's taking place here and why Nathan came to him and why he told him and why he called him out. I know there are some people who think that it is their spiritual gift to call other people's sins out. It's not your spiritual gift. However, I do believe with all my heart that God does send people at different times to either directly call our sin out or to do or say something that will call our sin out in a way that will bring to mind the need for repentance. That's happened more than once to me uh, in my life. So if you're able to stand for the reading of God's word, please stand as we read Psalm 51 together. It will be on the screen for you to see uh, or read along with me in yours. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from the blood guiltness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. 
then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's pray. Lord, as we enter uh, the time of your word and, and the sermon, Lord, uh, again, this, our prayer is an act of worship back to you. It's your word. I pray that you would use this messenger to give only your word, take away from my mind or my thoughts or my notes, those things that are not of you. Uh, but Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would feel the conviction of what it is that you are doing in their lives, and that, Lord, you would receive honor and glory and praise for it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this week as I was at World Changers, I was trying to sneak away and find time to prep a sermon and to think through things and write stuff out and whatever else, and I was exhausted, and we were driving back to the house last night, and I was kind of lamenting a little bit of that, that I didn't really have as much time as I would have liked to have had to totally prep the sermon. And one of my sons says, well, then you're just going to have to hope that God gives you the words. That's an every week occurrence. Uh, I got nothing for you, so I really hope, always, I pray, not hope. I know that the Lord has something for us, but um, that's my prayer always is that it is of the Lord. So the first thing we're going to deal with here today, and we're not going to go chronologically through all the verses because there's kind of a mix mash in what's going on here. Um, but we are going to talk a little bit about the background of what's taking place. So again, Nathan came to him. And most of you probably know that it's the story of David and Bathsheba, but there might be some people in the room that are newer to Christianity or, or just new to church in general and don't really know. Um, but one night, David was standing outside on his rooftop, and he is there in the, the, the town. He probably shouldn't have been. As a warrior, David would have been out with his uh, army fighting this battle, but David is not out with his army fighting this battle. Um, he instead is relaxing back at home. And as he stands there, he sees a beautiful woman across, and the Bible tells us she's extremely beautiful. And so he sees her and inquires about her. And he's told that this is the wife of Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. And so she's taken, basically. She is married. Uh, and so David, though, despite the fact that knowing that she is married and knowing the fact that it's not his to have, still sins for her. And sleeps with her. Um, and in the other writings around this and other things that we have learned about this, again, she is a person who is married to another. And he is taking her somewhat forcibly, using his kingship as his right to take this woman. And so I would honestly say that he is committing rape at this point. And so David has chosen to have this woman as his own. And then sends her back home after it is over. She sends word a time later that she is actually pregnant. So David tries to figure out, how do I cover this up? Right? David, again, we think of these Bible characters as, uh, not characters, I don't want to make it sound like it's a story story, but we, we think about these people from the, from the Bible and we're like, oh, these people are different than us. Nope. And again, God leaves the messy parts in there because it kind of, I don't want to say it gives us hope like, oh, we feel better about ourselves. We shouldn't feel better about ourselves, but at least... The, the Lord was working through those people. He probably surely can work through me also. And so David finds out that she's pregnant. And so David can, can, comes up with a plan. I'm going to have him come back from war. I'm going to ask him some questions, make it look like I'm trying to learn about the war. I'm going to let him stay with his wife. He'll sleep with his wife. She'll become pregnant by him. And then we'll figure out the birth details while he's away at war to make it seem like the time works out correctly. Unfortunately for David... Uriah is actually a good person, an honorable, a noble person. And when he comes back, he refuses to sleep there. In fact, he says that he will sleep with the slaves instead because he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to have time with his wife when the rest of his comrades are out fighting this battle. And so it doesn't work out for him to have his plan the way that his plan was meant to be. So as he goes back to war, David comes up with a new plan. We're going to find a way to make him in battle die and then I will do the right thing by comforting and marrying his wife. And then the fact that his child will be born will become a part of the line. This will be a very gracious and kingly thing for me to do. This is his new plan. So now David becomes a murderer. So that's the background here. He does end up taking Bathsheba as well. Um, but then he kind of keeps it under wraps and thinks that he's gotten away with it because he's the king. There are people who have done far worse things than he has done, so this can't be that bad. But what ends up happening to David is he has one sin upon another sin upon another sin upon another sin build up in his heart and his life. 
So that's where David's at when Nathan comes to him. We don't know what David, for sure, there's lots of Psalms. If you read Psalm 32, Psalm 130, I mean, there's a number of them that you can kind of almost read in tandem here, and you kind of get a picture of a bunch of others as well, where David's heart is crying out. So we don't know if he was in his inmost parts quietly crying out, but there has been no true conviction of sin, so there's been no true repentance of sin. But here we find that David's sin is dragged into the light. I don't know if you've ever had a sin in your life when someone finally found out about your sin. In college, I had a sin that I was struggling with and walking through, and friends found out about the sin and called me out about it. And again, it's one of those things, it's the most horrifying thing because you don't want to be called out for your sin, but it's also one of the freeing things because now we can actually deal with our sin once it's dragged into the light. So David's sin is dragged into the light when God sends Nathan to him to call him out. Again, it's a painful thing. This had to be painful for David because he thought he had gotten away with it. He thought only a few people knew about it, maybe some servants who had gone and gotten her uh, and had known about what took place. But most everybody else didn't know. But now it comes to light. Confession, let's be honest, in our own lives, in our own sins, in our own struggles, confession is the opposite of what we are wired to do. Confession and repentance are the opposite of what we're wired to do. I mean, as a person of this world who is born into sin and iniquity, as he says, I'm wired to, yeah, 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 but, 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 but. Did you see what so-and-so did? It's not as bad as this. You see, the reason I did it was, this was going on. It's actually so-and-so's fault because they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and so then I went over here and did this because they weren't doing what was needed. We, we like to come up with something. We like to prepare something. And in fact, I am guilty of this that in my past, uh, there might be a sin or an issue or some sort of struggle in my life. And I always prepared ahead of time in my head, here's what my response would be if anybody ever calls me out on this. The Lord will absolutely wreck you as a believer if that is your hope. If your hope is that you will hide it, you will hold on to it, and it will be okay. If the Spirit lives in you, you can't live that way. That's why when I have conversations with non-believers who are like, yeah, you call it sin, it's not that big of a deal. I'm sorry, but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you might go years in a sin. Years in a sin. But when it rears its ugly head over and over again, you will feel the pain of that sin. If you're sitting there going, I'm a believer and I've never felt that. We might want to question the first part of your sentence. There's no way as a believer that you can live in your sin and feel comfortable in your sin. It can't happen. You might still do it, but you don't feel comfortable about it. And again, this isn't a scare tactic. This isn't me being mean. I care enough about you. And in fact, I'm petrified that there are a number of people who say that they are believers, but in the end, as they stand before the judge, they will find out, I was never a believer. And a big thing that could have pointed them in that direction was the lack of conviction of sin in their life. Because confession is the opposite of what we're wired to do. Repentance is the opposite of what we are wired to do. But here, we see true repentance and recognition of sin. So what takes place here is David recognizes his sin. He calls it out. And we see a lot of that in verses 3 through 6, where he says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I don't know if you've ever had this, and I don't know, maybe you've overcome a sin. I have sins in my life, in my past, whatever they might be, that I still look back and I still think, why and how and that? And it's just like, it's almost like a videotape recording that takes place. And when the devil wants to remind me of something from my past, he plays that recording. And I'm reminded of it again. And if I don't remember that in Christ I have been forgiven and through Christ I have put that to death, I will let that recording take over my mind. I've let that happen where I've become so distraught over a past sin that I know I've confessed. I haven't committed it in years. I know I gave it to the Lord. I know I've put it to death in his name. But the devil loves to remind a person of their past when he knows that he can take advantage of it in their mind. And he says, my transgressions are ever before me. 
what happened on that night had to be playing over and over and over again in David's mind. What happened in the idea that he put uh, him to death. What happened with the child, and if you don't know, it goes on to say that the child won't live, and the child, his child doesn't live. And David faces many consequences for his sins. But his transgressions are ever before him. His sins are in his mind playing over and over again. Your sin that the Spirit is convicting you of may be doing that to you right now. There might be something that you've never fully confessed, something you've never really dealt with. Maybe you've never laid it out before anyone else. Maybe you have laid it out before someone else, but you still haven't dealt with it. I had sins that I would confess. We had a Bible study in our uh, men's, in our, in our dorm, right? We were a bunch of young guys. We were a bunch of knuckleheads, right? Uh, we were good friends hanging out. And we're like, we need to have a Bible study. And for a long time, we didn't take it very seriously. We would sit around and be like, yeah, I struggle with this. Me too, man. Jesus loves us. Bro. <laughs> and it wasn't until a little while down the road that we started to go, we don't ever do anything about the stuff that we confess. Like, we say it, and we don't even do anything about it. It's just more of a, I'm with you. So we resolved that we would do something about it. So if somebody struggled with uh, lust and their girlfriend, we would remind them before they went on a date with their girlfriend, Right? of what they should do that's rightly before the Lord with their girlfriend. If somebody struggled with cheating, there's a kid in our room that struggled with cheating, we would help him study, and we would remind him, the Lord knows whether you're cheating or not cheating. He was very, he's very good at cheating. Like, I learned so many ways that he, that he cheated. So when I was a teacher, I'd start looking for stuff. Like, I, who would have thought about this? He used a larger clear pen, wrote the answers, slid the piece of paper up into the clear pen, and so he just looked like he was writing with the pen while he had the answers inside the pen. That's very creative. Children, no, no. And we had another guy that would come in every week. And as young men, we struggle with lust. Every guy in the room, if there's a guy in the room that says, I have never struggled with lust, well, first off, let's deal with your lying problem, and then we'll deal with your lust problem after that. So a lot of us struggle with that, so we started leaving doors open or started doing other things or started holding each other accountable in different ways. And so there's this one kid that would come every week, and he would tell us this, and then he would go in his room, and he'd lock his room, and he'd have his computer in there. So one day, he confesses it to us, and our friend Adam, who we affectionately called Big Bald Dude because he was a large, massive, bald guy, walked out of the room, ripped his computer out of the wall, and shoved it into his closet in his room and said, go to the library from now on. There's a difference in dealing with sin and just kind of thinking you've dealt with sin. Maybe you've never really dealt with sin. Maybe you've done something, but you've never actually dealt with it to the root of its issues. You've never put it to death. And that sin hits you from time to time, or it's a long-running sin in your life. Then he says in verse 4, "...against you and you only have I sinned." Nathan said to David, why have you scorned, or in some translations, despised the Lord with your actions? What you did scorned and despised the Lord. It wasn't an oopsie-daisy. It wasn't a little thing. It wasn't a mistake. He planned it out. He saw her. He could have stopped it there. He lusted after her. He could have stopped it there. He could have gone inside and be like, nope. When he sent someone over to see who she was and they came back and said, she's married. He could have said, oh, well then she's off limits to me. When she was brought over to his palace, he could have been like, this was a terrible idea. You should go home. None of it. All of our sin is not an accident. Why did you scorn and despise the Lord? The reason David says this here is not that Uriah wasn't hurt. Obviously, he's dead. It's not that Bathsheba wasn't hurt. She was essentially raped. She was taken from her husband. She will then become pregnant, and she will lose that child because of this, this, this thing that happened. So it's not like he didn't harm those people. It's not that his sin didn't harm other people. It was tragic and terrible. Our sin does horrible things to other people. But what makes sin a sin? It's a sin because it's an affront to God. 
It's a sin because it goes against a holy God. If there was no God, and we just had a moral law that we came up with, boy, that moral law would be a mess. That's what the world would like for us to have. The world would love for us to have a moral law that we just kind of developed because what does that moral law look like? Oh, it's, it's changeable. Oh, you want that? We'll, we'll fit it in here. That's okay. Well, that used to be weird and terrible and awful, but we'll, we'll figure out how to get that in here. That's what happens when the world comes up with the moral law and it's not set against a holy, righteous God. So it doesn't mean that his consequences won't come. They do. It doesn't mean that the baby won't die. The baby does. Our sin impacts, crushes, harms others, and it is wrong. But the horror of sin, any sin at all, is that it is a sin against God. Sin is no little deal. Sin is not a little deal. It's not a little white lie. It's a heart that continues to lie, which then is an affront to God. David knows. I mean, he says it right there in the passage. If you were to, if you were to judge me, if you were to judge me as you, as you should, justified in your words and blameless, in your, if you would have done this, you could smite me right off the face of the earth right now. He'll say it in other, other psalms as well. You could cast me off forever righteously and be right doing so, God, because of my sin if God were to judge David righteously without mercy and grace, David knows what he deserves. And that's the thing for all of us. We'll get to it later in the sermon, but that's what makes God who God is. Verse 5, he reminds everyone that we are brought forth in iniquity. I mean, he's laying it all out here. He's going through a lot. There's actually a lot of really sound doctrine in his prayer here, his cries to the Lord here. This, this, is a, this is a cry to the Lord. I was brought forth in iniquity. A lot of people think, well, I've done some sins, so that makes me a sinner. The theology of the Bible, the doctrine of the Bible is that you were born a sinner, therefore you sin. You struggle your entire life, even as a believer who follows Jesus Christ, with sin because you were born into sin. That's part of the doctrine of who Christ is also, that he is the only one not born into sin. And so therefore, he could pay the price for us. So he says, look, I was born into sin. I've always been a sinner. I've wrestled with my sin my entire life. My transgressions are ever before me. You know that I'm a sinner. You know that I was brought forth in iniquity. It doesn't make it right that I did this, though. There are some people like, well, if we're all sinners then our sin really can't be that bad. That's, that's not what it is. I don't know if you had a mom that said this. Maybe my mom was the only one. If everybody was jumping off a bridge, <laughs> right? Oh, some of your moms said it too? Okay. The thing is, is that it doesn't make our sin okay. And there's no ranking scale with the Lord either. This is a hard thing. There might be some of you in here that have this sin, and it is like a weight around your neck in the deepest of deep sea waters that you are struggling with. There might be somebody here who struggles with lying. The world would tell you, this person's a bad person. This person's a better person. Sin in the eyes of the Lord is sin. It is sin. That, that's, that's the only thing it can be because it's an affront to him. And God's forgiveness for this and God's forgiveness for this is available all day, every day, to the person who is willing to repent. The person who is carrying this and the person who is doing this both need the equal amount of forgiveness, which is total and complete through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I was brought forth. It doesn't give you an out for your sin. It just means that the battle is ever before you. It's always going to be a battle. And there are going to be times where the battle gets really hard and really rough. I mean, we talked about that in Psalm 42. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Trust in God. The depth of our corruption will live on and overtake and consume us unless it is somehow crucified. And David doesn't have Christ as crucified Savior over his life yet. This hasn't happened here but he knows the character and the holiness and the purposes of God. And so he is crying out, knowing who God is, 
that God, from the very beginning of the Bible, very beginning of the Word, all the information that David knew about God from the very beginning all the way through, knew he knew he's a God of forgiveness and mercy and grace. And he throws himself before him and says, forgive me, O God. And the thing is, is that people are like, well, he sinned against the law. Here's the amazing thing. He didn't have Christ yet, so it wasn't, so they still were living under the law. David understood something so deeply here. I think this is why we can think, we can understand that David was a, a man after God's own heart. David knew that he didn't sin against the law, but he sinned against the very being of God. He sinned against the very being, nature, and wholeness of an almighty, eternal, perfect God. It wasn't, I broke a law. He broke a lot of laws. If you go back and look at all the things, that not just in this story with Bathsheba, but all the way throughout his life, and you started to tick off all the laws that he was supposed to keep as king and keep as a Jew, he missed a lot. He screwed up a bunch. But every single one of those wasn't necessarily against the law. Remember, the law was set in place so that they could realize, you can't do it. You can't keep this law. I gave you these laws, but you can't keep these laws. David understood anew, as we need to understand and know, that every sin is against the very perfect being of God. The depravity of his sin against the light of God and who he was and the truth of who God is. As we read earlier, Psalm 32, David writes, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. I don't know if you've ever had one of those sins in your life. Maybe you still do. Maybe you thought you dealt with it, but you didn't, and it's still there. Your bones are wasting away. The depth of the pain is so excruciating that if you could just, you just, you almost hope. Here's the crazy thing about the sins that I've had in my past that I was like this. I almost hoped for a Nathan. Somebody just call me out on this so I can just let it go. Because I'm not strong enough to let it go myself. I hoped for a Nathan because it was so painful. And my bones did feel like they were wasting away because the guilt was overwhelming. And the crazy thing is, the Lord is waiting for us to turn and repent and know what forgiveness feels like. And to experience the wholeness of that forgiveness if we would repent. So we see here, David, the next point is, he repented. Real repentance. Real repentance. This is a broken spirit, right? Look what he says back here, uh, verses uh, like 16 through 17. For you do not delight in sacrifices, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. He is broken. His heart is shattered. Again, it's not he got caught. It's the overwhelming sense of the guilt before a holy, purposeful God that said, you are a sinner, repent and turn from this, that drew him to this point. This is a deep confession. This is a broken heart that is crying out to a holy God. He didn't make any demands here. When we read this, don't read it as demands where he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. He's calling on it because he knows it exists and it's there. He also knows, if you read all of the Psalms of David, that he doesn't deserve it. But he keeps calling on him because his character says, I love you. I will show mercy and grace to you. Repent and turn back to me. Think about the Israelite people. They kept screwing up. And when they would finally repent, did he go, well, I'm done with you anyway. He kept bringing them back. As his people, he kept bringing them back. If you are saved and redeemed in Jesus Christ, there is no limit to it. It doesn't mean we keep on going, but don't fall into that trap. David doesn't make demands. He doesn't stand there as a king going, I as a king deserve this. He doesn't say, "Uh, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. I've done some things, but these guys were worse, but please help my transgressions. No, he doesn't burrow deeper. He doesn't deny it. He turns to God. Sinner, turn to God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you have sin in your life, which we all do, but if there's something so heavy in your life, you haven't dealt with it, 
Turn to God. Quit turning to this and to that. Quit pulling in. Quit denying. Quit burrowing deeper because all you're finding is a bigger hole to climb out of. Give it to God. As Psalm 130 says, out of the depths I cry to you. Cry out to the Lord. Hoping that no one will find out what you've done or what you're walking through or the sin that's in your life. Hoping no one finds that out while you're trying not to do it again isn't repentance. I've I've been there. I hope no one finds out. I'm going to try real hard to make it not happen again. That was never a repentant heart. That was a human answer to a spiritual problem that will never find healing. Hoping no one finds out while you try to not do it again isn't repentance. Hoping to move on or pretend that it didn't happen won't lead to change either. And you'll never feel fully forgiven. Maybe you do feel bad about it. Maybe you feel sorry about it. Maybe you, I don't know, maybe there's some deep regret there. But you've never fully actually dealt with it, confessed it, repented from it, turned from it, and and cast it off away from you. You never feel fully forgiven, even though full forgiveness is found in Christ. The two most dangerous sins in your life, as I was thinking about this week and kind of praying and thinking, the two most dangerous sins in my life, the one I'm most defensive about, that's not a sin. It's well earned. This is the one the Lord was working on me this week. Read Psalm 51. I'm supposed to be on a mission trip. I'm supposed to be on a high for the Lord. And the Lord's like, hey, there's still one we haven't dealt with. Well, there's a lot we haven't dealt with. There's a big one we haven't dealt with. Constantly all week working on me in the midst of that. The second one that's the most dangerous sin in your life is the one that you fight hard to hide. The two most dangerous sins are the one you're most defensive about and the one that you work hard to hide because you will never, ever, ever find healing. So what does he do? What should you do in your repentance? He pleads for renewal. Verses one and two, have mercy on me. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. This is, if you've ever taken a medicine, so I was sick. Now maybe I've used this before, I don't remember all the time. And I went to get, I, they couldn't figure out what it was, and they finally figured out what was wrong with me. I was really, really, really sick. And they gave me medicine, and that medicine uh, was supposed to help me. And the medicine, what it had to do, because I was having so much GI issue, was it had to basically scrub every organ as it worked its way through over a course of about four or five days. I thought I was dying. I couldn't get up. I couldn't do anything. For a long time, I was super sick. But after I took the last pill and finally woke up on the bathroom floor like a day later, I stood up and I'm like, oh, I kind of feel better. For the first time in months, I feel better. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. It doesn't mean it won't be painful. But you will see a major difference on the other side if he has thoroughly washed you and cleansed you from your sin. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Again, a desire to turn and be completely different. Repentance is a turning away from. Repentance is a confession and then it's a turning away from. I will be whiter than snow. If you're not turning away from it, you're just repenting it or you're just saying it out loud, you are feeling sorry you are not repenting. It doesn't mean you're not going to struggle still. Still struggle. But the fight is back upstream, not with the flow. Verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. The mending, the healing that comes through true confession and repentance. And create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. A right spirit to worship you. If you're mired in sin... Maybe you came in here this morning and you're mired in sin. First off, whatever that sin is, whatever you've done, this is the right place. You're, you came to the right place. Not because I've got something for you, other than I've got the word of God for you. Other than the fact that Christ is the answer to that weight that you're carrying. But if you don't have a clean heart before the Lord, 
If you don't have a renewed spirit, it's really hard to worship God. I've walked into worship. I've walked into church that way. I didn't sing a single song. I didn't hear a single word that was said. I sure didn't want to sit through the long-winded preacher's sermon. I didn't have a clean heart. I didn't have a worshipful heart. I can't have a worshipful heart if my heart is consumed with sin. And so many people want to say a prayer of sorry. Few want to pray this prayer. Because with this prayer, you're looking for action to be taken. Not just by you trying to do better, but relying on the Lord to change and make you new and consume you with his fire. Few want to do what it takes to deal seriously with sin in a way that will give you a clean heart. But it's the only way. I mean, what is it about the sin that you're clinging to? What is it about the sin you're clinging to that is so much better undealt with than dealing with it with, between you and the Lord? It'll hurt. Yes. But will you finally feel free? Yes. I don't want anyone to know. Understandable. But not okay to sit in. Nothing about your sin and sitting in it can be better than dealing with it between you and the Lord. God doesn't want you to try harder. Oftentimes when we try harder, we fight from freedom. Because we are fighting in our own strength. God wants you to turn, repent, trust him, walk with him, go with him, read back into his word, let it wash over you, let him give you a clean heart, and he wants to walk with you in a way that is different and anew than you could possibly imagine. Think about the difference between what I just described and try harder. A lot of us want to try harder. Confess to the Lord and if needed to another. Repent of what you're going through and what you're dealing with, and turn back to the Lord. Get into his word with him so that you can actually learn from him the truth of what it is to walk rightly. Pray fervently for the Lord to deal with you. And guess what? If you're sitting there and your mind knows it's a sin, but your heart won't do it, wait on the Lord. You might be there right now. Your mind might be telling you that's a sin, but your heart refuses to confess or deal with it. Only through Christ, only through repentance, only through giving it up to the Lord will we finally see that true, whole forgiveness. And you know it's sin, you know you're hiding your sin. You may not even feel fully remorseful about your sin, even though you know what you are doing or have done is sin. And again, it's sin before the Lord. Maybe you've harmed someone else or other people in it. But again, it's before the Lord. So if you haven't dealt with it rightly before him, you're still feeling constricted by what it's doing to you. There's a gap between your head knowledge and your heart knowledge. But wait on the Lord. Hope in God. Pursue him in any way you can possibly think of. Trust that he will do what he says he will do. Trust the character that the word of God tells us that he has, that he will not let you go. He has not forsaken you. He does show grace even in the midst of the worst of the worst. One of our students was having a conversation with someone this week about Jesus sharing the gospel. And they just couldn't get over the fact that babies would die or that people would have cancer. And how could a God that does those things, instead of dealing with the root issue, in a world of sin that chooses sin, desires sins, and wants sin, the issue doesn't lie with the Lord. The issue lies with the sinner. So the healing and the answers don't come through logical assent but through a right understanding of who God is and his sovereignty. We can still question. We can still wonder. I have, guess what? 
I have that same question, man. But I wrestle in the arena of the Lord and his word. Well, they're probably just wrestling in logic and worldly thought. David says in verses 16 and 17, the right answer again is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That's when it's finally dealt with. God doesn't want a trite confession. He doesn't want sacrifices, as David says. Look, I'd, I'd run out and give you a sacrifice if you just make this deep pain of my sin go away. You don't want that. Because all that would be is a burnt animal, not a true confession. God doesn't want you to feel bad about what you've done alone. He wants you to recognize what sin is, where it's coming from, and kill it in any way possible so that you can walk in a right relationship of freedom with him. And the last thing is this. Like we sang and we'll sing just briefly here in just a moment, how deep the Father's love. So David's called out, right, in 2 Samuel. And his sins are called out, and he knows what the sins are, and Nathan knows what the sins are, and other people know what the sins are. But Nathan will then go on to say, after, you know, you're going to face the consequences. The baby's not going to live, this and that and whatever else. But he says, the Lord has not cast you away. I think that would get read by pretty fast or angrily by some. He, he did all sorts of horrible things. He should be cast away. He's the guy that should be cast away. If we start pointing the fingers for the people who should be cast away, it's going to come back to me pretty dang quick. Again, he's, I would say, maybe you're going to, maybe you're going to argue with me. I don't know. But I would say that he essentially committed rape. He forced a woman to cheat on her husband. Then he set up the murder of the husband. He's a pretty bad guy. But part of the word that the Lord gave to Nathan to go say is, I will not cast you away. Our default position is that God is always mad at us. Or at best, he tolerates us and puts up with us. We forget that God is a God of forgiveness. He is a God of love and mercy and grace. When the world says this, and they will throw it back at you, well, God's a God of love, he's a God of mercy, he's a God of grace. What they're saying is so that I can affirm what they want me to affirm. Well, God's a God of love, so he's okay with it. He is a God of love. He's a God of love who sent his son to die on a cross, not so you could keep waddling in your sin and calling it okay. Jesus, every time he encountered someone who was sinful or every time he encountered someone who came to him for something, he said, go and sin no more. He didn't just take care of the issue. He says, go and sin no more. There's an accountability to the way that we live our lives. So the world wants to say that in a really stupid, condescending way to let me do what I want. When I exclaim it, it's because I know who I am before a holy God and don't deserve it, and I'm so thankful for it because I didn't deserve it, I don't get it, can't comprehend. My brain just can't wrap around the idea of knowing who I am and knowing that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. And Romans tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I didn't get my act together. David didn't get his act together, and God forgave him. David was able to see the overwhelming love and forgiveness of God through a repenter's eyes. That's us too. And yet as a child of God, as his adopted son, no matter what I've done and what I'm going through, no matter what you've done or what you're going through, if you're a believer, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, what does the scripture say he does to us? He lavishes his love, mercy, and grace on us. Lavishes. He didn't sprinkle it on us. He doesn't give us a little bite of it every so often. He lavishes it. Every breath I'm given is his love, grace, and mercy given to a person who doesn't deserve a single one. Yet he gives it. And he gives it with a purpose. He has not abandoned you, no matter what you're going through. If you haven't fully confessed, you have fully confessed. Nobody knows what you've done. Everyone knows what you've done. There's some of us that are like, everyone knows what I did. I don't know what to do with that. Give it to the Lord. Turn to him. 
walking in repentance to him will show even the hardest of hearts after some time that, okay, something's different there. They didn't respond the way they should have. We've drugged them through the mud, and yet they're still holding fast. How does that happen? In the Lord. He doesn't hate you. Yeah, you've sinned, and I've sinned, and there's going to be consequences for our sin. But even through it all, Scripture tells us that he is long-suffering with us. I mean, we always try to compare it in ways that we can understand. As a parent, I try to be long-suffering with my kids. They know I love them. I really do. And you guys know, your kids know you love them. But sometimes they ask way too many questions when you don't want any more questions. Maybe you've been in the car for a really long time. And now they've decided it's time to show their depravity towards each other. We aren't as long-suffering as we think we'd like to be. God in his mercy and grace is so long-suffering with us. If you walked in with it, if you're a believer and you walked in with something, lay it down. Lay it down with the confidence, as David did, that I can trust the character of God, that even though I have sinned, even though he has forgiven me, because again, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he has forgiven you of your sin. It doesn't mean we stop repenting and confessing. It doesn't mean I get re-saved. I can't lose my salvation. It says that if God holds us in his hand, who can tear us from it? But a right heart and mind of a believer is a repentant heart and mind of a believer. Turn to him. Confess it to him. Lay it down to him. That's how deep the Father's love is for us. Take a second, believer, and think about how amazing that makes God to us. Even while we were still sinners that Christ died for us, I don't want to do something for someone who wrongs me once sometimes. God does not regret saving you either. Maybe you're that person who literally thinks he has to regret saving me. No. There is zero regret in the character of God when he does something in somebody's life. So if he has saved you, he does not regret doing so. The sin you committed didn't surprise him. He knows it. Here's the thing that has kind of changed my heart on some of my sins. He's there when you're committing the sin. He saw it happen. The Spirit was in your heart and life, soul-wise, when you decided to do that sin. He's fully aware, yet he doesn't reject you. He doesn't cast you off. He doesn't regret it. But he does call you to repentance. And in repentance, we get a bigger, deeper picture of the Father's love. Some of you, and I used the analogy when I was first here in view of a call, and I thought, I'm going to hit them with something, and if they don't like it, they're going to be like, no, this guy. My wife even asked me, why would you use that analogy? You're not going to get the job. <laughs> but I think of God's grace, mercy, love, and there are just our relationship with him like a pool. Many Christians are more than happy to stand in the ankle-deep waters of the pool with the little children. There's plenty of adult Christians who walk around in fear of what God must think about them as they walk around the shallow end of the pool. You're in it. You're saved. But you're standing in the pee end of the pool with the children. When the call is to swim out to the depths of grace, mercy. Because when you get out there, you're like, there's more? I've done all that I've done, and there's more? It's such an overwhelming sense of absolute and utter worship and glory to God and awe of him that despite who I am, there's more. Whatever it is, whatever that sin is that you are holding on to that has not been fully pulled to the light, deal with it. Truly repent today, hate it, whatever it takes to draw it to the light and let that thing die in the light. Christ has paid that penalty for that sin. You covering it up makes it look like you can keep it from him, but he desires to take it from you. Why wouldn't you fully release it in repentance to him and feel what it's like to have 
that forgiveness that is already there completely and utterly wash over you anew. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, that forgiveness is available to you the first time today. That forgiveness that says, I am a sinner, you are a holy God. I never knew it before, I never understood it before, but I need to be saved. Because there is a very real heaven and there's a very real hell. And those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, not might be, will be saved, and we will be together in heaven. Yet there is a place for those who have not called on the name of the Lord, and it will be eternal, and it will be punishment. And the more I've been, the longer I've been saved, I don't run to him or think about my salvation as a, I, oof, I barely made it out of the fire. Thank you, Lord. How deep the Father's love. Last, Psalm 32, 1 through 2. David says this, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and into whose spirit there is no deceit. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We don't just thank you for this morning as a way of being flippant in our prayer, Lord. We thank you that you gave us this morning. We thank you, God, that you gave us another day. You gave us another breath. You brought us here, no matter what condition we are in, to worship and to serve and to love you. Lord, if there's someone in the room that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, you brought them here today on purpose. They may not realize it. It was on purpose so that you could deal in their heart and life today. Lord, if there's someone in this room that's dealing with sin and has not brought it to the light, I pray today that through the conviction of your spirit in their life, not through the words that I've spoken, I can't force anyone to confess, but I pray, Lord, that they would listen to the still small voice, or maybe it's a loud crying voice calling out to them to change, repent, turn, and follow. Today is the day for that. I pray that they would lay it down. Deal with all of us where we're at and the way that we each need to be dealt with, Lord, so that we can be drawn to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.